Washington State, the Pacific Northwest. My home and the setting for the subject of today's video. On the morning of August 26, 1914, the steamship Admiral Sampson departed Seattle on its way to Juneau, Alaska with 126 souls aboard. In the heavily foggy conditions, another steamship was inbound to Seattle, the Princess Victoria. At 6.15 a.m., near Point No Point, 18 miles north of the city, the two ships would collide in what would prove to be a deadly accident and the final resting place for the Samson. In this video, I'll be covering the history of the Samson from its construction in 1898 to the collision and its sinking in 1914. This is the story of the SS Admiral Sampson. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 1898. William Cramp and Sons Shipbuilding, Yard Number 297. On the 27th of September, the SS Admiral Sampson was completed and launched. She was an Admiral class steamship with a gross register tonnage of 2,262, a length of 280 feet or 85.3 meters, a beam of 36.1 feet or 11 meters, a depth of 22.7 feet or 6.9 meters, with an installed horsepower of 2,500. Built for the American Mail Steamship Company and named in the honor of U.S. Navy Admiral William T. Sampson, she was quickly put into service by the United Fruit Company and began her career making regular trips between Philadelphia and Caribbean Sea ports. The United Fruit Company possessed land in Colombia, Costa Rica, Spanish Honduras, Belize, and in the Spanish Main, and they had a fleet of vessels frequenting similar routes as the Sampson during its service with the company. Later in February of 1900, the Samson came to the rescue of U.S. transport ship McPherson, which had been disabled by a broken propeller shaft off of Hampton Roads, Virginia. Later in 1902, she sank the cargo schooner Charlie Bucky in a collision in the Massachusetts Bay during heavily foggy conditions around 2 o'clock in the morning. Four of the schooner crew drowned. Captain Freeman Huntley, Mate Elmer Huntley, and Seaman Norman Sampson and Mark Beard. The schooner had been loaded with cement, sinking in only two minutes. It was investigated on November 5th, and on November 18th, a decision was made exonerating the officers of the Sampson. Talk about foreshadowing. Later in her career in 1909, the Alaska Pacific Steamship Company purchased the Samson, as well as her sister ship, the Admiral Farragut, as a result of its expanding business on West Coast shipping routes. The Alaska Pacific Steamship Company would ultimately prove to be a short-lived operation, existing only from the years of 1906 through 1912. It was a company created by E. E. Kane, who had used the steamships Buckman and Watson on the route between Seattle, Tacoma, and San Francisco. The company expanded after taking over management of the Alaska Coast Company, which had operated the steamships Genie and Portland. Before the end of 1912, the company's directors would merge Alaska Pacific with the Alaska Coast Company to form the new Pacific Alaska Navigation Company. The new company would offer freight and passenger services between San Francisco and Puget Sound in Seattle, as well as Alaskan ports as far north as Nome, Alaska. An Alaskan route was one with which the Samson would find itself departing on a foggy Seattle morning of August 26, 1914. At 4 o'clock in the morning on August 26, 1914, the SS Admiral Sampson pulled away from Seattle, with 126 crew and passengers aboard, bound for Juneau, Alaska. On the heavily foggy waters of Puget Sound, 
The near zero visibility was exacerbated by smoke from nearby forest fires, making the already present dangers of the fog even more prevalent. Captain Zimro Moore did his best to err on the side of caution. He posted extra lookouts, sounded the ship's whistle at frequent intervals, and ordered the engines to be slowed down to a mere three knots as they crept their way through the pre-dawn darkness. A few minutes past six o'clock with Captain Moore at the helm, the Samson was approaching point no point, a lighthouse atop a low spit of sand that extends a quarter mile into the waters, marking the entrance to Puget Sound from Admiralty Inlet. Around this time, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company's 300-foot steamship, Princess Victoria, was en route into Seattle, also steaming around three knots with similar safety precautions in place as the Samson. During the Victoria's time in service, she routinely ran routes between Victoria and Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, down to Seattle, Washington in the United States. On this morning, she was once again en route into Seattle, though this time she was on an imminent collision course with the Samson. At 6.15 a.m., the Victoria suddenly came bearing down on the Samson out of the heavy fog, ramming the Samson broadside just aft of amidships. More precisely, near the Samson's after hatch, a spot about midway between amidships and the stern. The impact of the Victoria with her knife-like steel bow sliced deep into the Samson. The damage tore a 12-foot gash into the Samson's steel hull, rupturing several large containers of fuel oil on board, which immediately caught fire. Realizing the severity of the damage to the Samson, Captain P.J. Hickey of the Victoria quickly made the decision to keep the Victoria's engines ahead, and as a result, reduced the amount of water rushing into the Samson's wound, allowing more time for her passengers and crew to evacuate. The Victoria's crew lowered their lifeboats immediately to assist the Samson. At the same time, Captain Moore aboard the Samson ordered his lifeboats to be lowered, though he would ultimately only have time to lower one, using his pocket knife to saw the ropes. Captain Moore quickly ordered his passengers and crew to jump overboard to be picked up by the Victoria's lifeboats, as the situation was growing more desperate. There were many reports of passengers simply climbing or jumping onto the decks of the Victoria while she was continuing to plug the hull of the Samson. The wireless operators of both vessels had been transmitting SOS signals constantly. Aboard the Samson, wireless operator Walter E. Recker also assisted with passengers boarding the lifeboats during his transmissions, before ultimately joining the captain on the bridge. The Seattle Star, a newspaper that seized publication in 1947, printed a few first-hand accounts. Claire Bohr, on her way to a teaching job in Ketchikan, reported that she heard and felt the crash and rushed to the deck, dressing as she ran. The deck was rapidly filling with water when someone from the Princess Victoria threw her a rope. I clutched for the rope, but missed, she said. George Peterson, another passenger, seized the rope and then the school teacher. They were thrown into the sound, he said, and struggled to hold on until a lifeboat picked them up. Another passenger, Al Paris, one of 20 structural iron workers on board, dashed to the deck with his suitcase in hand. According to the star, he arrived on deck to find the anchor chain from the Princess Victoria invitingly nearby. He backed up, took a running jump, and sailed across a space of water and grabbed the anchor chain, still holding his suitcase. Hand over hand, he climbed the chain and got aboard. About 15 minutes after the collision, as the fuel oil fires began to rapidly spread on the Samson, the Victoria was forced to pull away, opening the gash on the Samson to the incoming sea. Without the support of the Victoria plugging the hole, the Samson broke in half. Though there was time for him to evacuate, Captain Zimro S. Moore refused to leave his post, insisting that he remain with his ship as she went to her grave. The forward section immediately sank. Another near disaster became imminent soon thereafter, as the aft section of the Samson that had remained afloat temporarily swung towards the Victoria, barely missing her. 
One of the Victoria's lifeboats was also nearly swamped as the hulk of the Samson plunged beneath the waters of Puget Sound. Aboard the Princess Victoria at the time of the collision, most of the passengers were still in their rooms. After feeling a slight impact, they'd begun to awaken and dress, though by the time they arrived on deck, the Samson had already disappeared beneath the waves. The SOS calls were first received at Port Townsend, and the revenue cutter Ulnaga left immediately for the collision site. However, by the time she arrived on the scene, there was nothing to be done. The captain and crew of the Victoria had made sure that all of those in lifeboats or still in the water after the Samson went down had been accounted for and taken aboard his ship. With a 14-foot gash in her bow, about a meter above the waterline, the Victoria slowly made her way into Seattle, arriving at Pier 1 around 10 o'clock in the morning. As the Victoria pulled into the Canadian Pacific Railroad Wharf shortly after 10 p.m., she was met with a large crowd. The Seattle Star reported, Her decks were crowded with people, half of them well-dressed, and the other half with only fragments of clothing protecting them from the cold. A gaping wound loomed large in the vessel's bow, only two or three feet above the waterline, and in the breach hung a battered hatch cover from the Admiral Sampson. A roll call would confirm the names of those lost. Passenger Ruby Whitson Branberry, who had married during the previous October. Passenger George Bryant, a printer who was headed to Alaska in search of employment. Passenger John McLaughlin, who had been last seen clinging to the ship's rigging as the Admiral Sampson sank. Ship's cook, L. Cabanis, who had been raising four young children on his own, following the death of his wife two years prior. Scottish-born stewardess Mary Campbell, who had been on her first voyage aboard the Samson. Quartermaster C.M. Marquist and Captain Zemro S. Moore. Chief Engineer Alan J. Noon, who had reportedly drowned while trying to save Mrs. Branberry. Watchman A. Stater and mess boy John G. Williams. Ezra Byrne later passed away at Providence Hospital due to burns, and wireless operator Walter E. Recker. Recker's name was added to the Wireless Operator's Memorial in New York City's Battery Park. His name is near that of Jack Phillips, who died from exposure after the sinking of the RMS Titanic. The Wireless World, a United Kingdom technical magazine first known as Marcinograph, which ran from 1911 to 2008, reported in April of 1915, As the cargo of his vessel consisted of oil, the horrors of the fire were super added to the situation, and Wrecker found too much work to do to think of his own safety. He shared the fate of the captain side by side with him on the bridge. Telegraph and Telephone Age, another technical magazine, reported on May 16, 1915, it is proof of the bravery and efficiency of the crew that most of the passengers were saved. Wrecker might have saved himself by taking to the boats with the passengers and the greater part of the crew. He remained at the wireless telegraph key, however, giving direction to the rescuing ship, which proved invaluable. He ignored repeated appeals from the boats to save himself. When the last boat had left safely, Wrecker reported to the bridge and remained to share the fate of the captain. It proved to be too late for them to leave, and eight of the men, including the wireless operator, went down with the ship. In such a rapidly worsening situation, it is incredibly fortunate that so few were lost. Quick thinking on parts of both the crews, the Samson and Victoria, alleviated a tragedy that could have been so much worse. The wreckage of the SS Admiral Samson would remain undisturbed for 80 years due to its depth and the difficulty of a salvage operation. However, in 1991, Gary Severson and Kent Bernard, using side-scan sonar, located the Samson's final resting place. The following year, they would obtain exclusive salvage rights to the ship.
The wreckage of the Samson rests 320 feet below the surface of Puget Sound, directly under a major shipping route. Her hull rests upright, but in two pieces as sketched in this illustration here. During the first dives on the site, the salvagers exploring in a two-man submarine retrieved several artifacts, including the ship's whistle. By 1994, they had expressed their hopes of finding the ship's safe, which was believed to contain a valuable diamond necklace, with another potential prize including a suitcase containing gold that had been brought aboard by a passenger. The ship's bell, whistle, a porthole, and several other objects are among the most notable relics recovered so far, though. However, I've only been able to find records of dives as late as 2014. Due to the diving expertise required, the depth, and the fact that the US Coast Guard must be involved due to the site's proximity to active shipping lanes, dives on the site are not very frequent. DCS Films has a few really well-documented dives on the site, and I highly recommend checking the links in the video description here to visit their site and see the full uncut versions of their videos as well as their own dive reports. Footage I've been showing here is highly edited, but they've produced some very good short films following their excursions to the Samson. Time has certainly taken a toll on the wreck. Lots of apparent decay and growth visible. Visibility is too low to get a large scale view of the wreck in its entirety from what I've seen, but hopefully someday we'll get some good photogrammetry reconstruction images of the wreck. Perhaps one already exists, but in my internet sleuthing, I was unable to find any. And so that will do it for my presentation of the story of the SS Admiral Sampson. I was born and raised in this area of Washington, and... Until I discovered this story while I was researching video topics, I'd never heard of the ship's story before. My dad used to be a scuba diver, and uh, I'm sure he would have been really interested in this topic as well. In fact, he probably knew about it. But uh, I was really, really happy to put this video together and be able to present it on my channel. As I've said in previous videos, I've been fascinated by ships and shipwrecks since I was a kid. And uh, being able to make a video about a shipwreck story from my area is uh, something that I had a lot of fun with. On a side note to anyone still watching or regular viewers, sorry about how long of a break I took between this video and the Harrisville video. Life has been a bit busy and complicated and I just didn't have the time I needed to put in enough effort to finish this one up in a timely fashion. So hopefully we'll get back to normal now. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the story. Hopefully you learned something new, or were at the very least entertained by it. If you did enjoy it, give the video a like. It helps me a lot out with the YouTube algorithm. And if you enjoy my videos, consider subscribing. I would love to see this channel grow. If you think I've made any errors, or feel that I left any details out, or you would just like to share your thoughts about this, feel free to leave it in the comments section below. Thank you all very much for watching. Until next time. Take care.